Hi, welcome back to educator.com. This is the lesson on animal behavior. So a behavior overview first. What is a behavior? It's an animal response to a stimulus. And a stimulus is anything in the environment that has to do with a change, something occurring, and the animal noticing that. Sometimes the environment is actually internal, though. Uh, we will react to things that happen in our own body. We'll react to things that happen outside of our body. So sometimes the stimulus is internal, and sometimes it's external. And the stimulus will initiate a response, and that response is the behavior. So what's the origin? Where does it come from? What is the origin of behavior? Well, is it from genetics? Is it from learning? That's the question. So sometimes um, it can be like in our DNA. There's something in our DNA that is causing us to have this reaction. And regardless of the environmental exposure that this individual has had, they'll react the same way. Uh, sometimes the environment has given the animal enough information and changes behavior over time to adjust to the environment. So that's the whole uh, nurture nature thing like nature referring to the DNA, nurture referring to how they've been exposed to different environmental factors. Sometimes the behavior is innate. It is completely uh, from the genes. It's instinctual. And other times it is learned over time. Behaviors give a competitive advantage. That's why they've been retained. And over evolutionary periods, they can be enhanced and, um, you know, modified for the better. Darwin talked about descent with modification. It's baby steps that get to the point where you have these amazing behaviors today. But of course, if the behavior gives any competitive advantage and it can either be passed on via genes or passed on with teaching it via learned behavior, it'll be retained and it's going to definitely benefit. So natural selection is a big part of it. Here we have some chimps playing around um, and there are lots of interesting behaviors that you can see in primates, of course innate behaviors. So these are genetically based. They are not learned. Innate pretty much means instinct. Um, it's within. You're born with it. So a stimulus triggers an innate response. Um, here's an example. Uh, dogs and, and, you know, members of, of the wolf group, you know, canines, they communicate via howling. And it depends on what's going on. Like they, sometimes they'll bark, sometimes they'll howl. Uh, if you have a pet dog and uh, an ambulance drives by with the sirens, the dog will just, oh, oh, it just immediately will start doing that. That's an innate response. Um, it will take a long time for it to like realize, oh, that's an ambulance. And maybe with the owner, you know, disciplining the dog, maybe it'll stop doing it. But to the dog, it sounds like a howl from an animal uh, a little ways away. And they, they just have that automatic reaction. That's an innate response. And so it's observed among animals of a population, even in different environmental conditions. So even in different environmental conditions, that's a way you can eliminate the environment's impact on it and modify a behavior over time. Because if you have two animals of the same species that are in very different environmental conditions, but still do the same thing, that's a good sign that it's probably programmed within their DNA, which they have a lot of similarities because they're the same species. Now, one example of an innate behavior is a fixed, fixed action pattern, an FAP. So a fixed action pattern, here's two examples, goose with eggs. So a lot of geese, the mother has this automatic reaction where if the egg, um, you know, kind of moves too much, she will start moving the egg like this with her beak and she just automatically does it, you know, pushing it. Even if you move the egg away from her, she will still keep doing this. It's just she's programmed to do this egg moving, um, you know, to, to move and protect her eggs um, and keep them alive. So it's this interesting reaction. It's just fixed action. You know, she's just going to do this thing when that particular stimulus uh, is noticed. Another one with birds is baby cuckoos uh, or cuckoos knocking out other eggs. So with the cuckoo bird, uh, typically the mother will lay eggs in some other nest, another bird's nest that's not the same species. When her babies hatch, they have an automatic reaction to push eggs out of the nest because that's competition for resources. Now, does the baby bird like actually realize what it's doing, that it's pushing them out as a selfish thing? I don't know. But what we do know is that it automatically does it. It is not a learned behavior. Um, long, long, long time ago, 
uh, a baby had this tendency to do that. It, it did it. It was passed on in terms of this, this urge and this tendency to do it. And it's via what they're born with. It's that innate uh, DNA. Now learned behaviors. So this results from an interaction between innate behaviors, which you know come from DNA, and experience. So it's the environment impacting that and changing it over time. Habituation is one example. So a decrease in response after repeated exposure. We've all experienced habituation. If you're exposed to the same stimulus over and over and over and over on a daily basis, and it has no negative impact on you, you're going to start to ignore it. That's habituation. Uh, I've heard that people who work in, um, you know, a perfume store or a store that has a, a very strong smell, they ev eventually get habituated to it. They eventually stop noticing it. But you know, where their friends go and visit them at work, they'll be like, "Wow, how do you, how do you stand it in here?" Like, I don't even notice it anymore. That's habituation. Another example with birds would be um, when a baby bird hatches and it's in his nest. Uh, they'll react to everything that's up above them. Like a leaf will hit them and they'll freak out. Um, you know, something will fly overhead that's, that's not a predatory bird and they'll freak out and react to it. Over time, if they keep seeing that particular stimulus and noticing it and there's no negative effect tied in with it, it's actually better for them to ignore it. It's a waste of energy if they keep ignoring it. That's habituation. Classic conditioning. So this is when unrelated stimuli are associated together and have some kind of impact on the animal's behavior. The classic example is Pavlov's dogs. So a Russian scientist named Ivan Pavlov, uh, he was interested in dogs' reaction to food physiologically. So here you have a dog that's been preserved with taxidermy. It's, it's no longer alive, but it's preserved and this is what Pavlov did with a lot of them. He tied um, this device to catch saliva in this little area and measure saliva secretions. He also measured um, secretions from the gut, gastric secretions in response to food exposure. But what he's famous for is he would actually expose dogs uh, to meat or meat powder. And when he did that, he would ring a bell. And the dogs kept associating the bell with the food, the bell with the food. So every time they get you know, fed with the bell, they of course would salivate because, oh, I've got to get fed. After doing that enough time and tying together the unrelated bell with the food, eventually he could just ring the bell and the dogs would start salivating because they're tying together those two uh, stimuli. Uh, so that just shows that depending on what an animal is exposed to in their environment, it can impact their reactions. Operant conditioning is a little bit different from classical conditioning uh, because it comes with positive or negative rewards. Of course, you can consider, you know, back to classical, the, pa the Pavlovian thing with, oh, the animal's being rewarded with the food. No, the food was just normal part of its day, you know, being fed like it normally would. And it was associated, associating something completely unrelated to the, the feeding aspect uh, with that. With operant conditioning, you're pairing uh, some kind of exposure with either uh, positive or negative rewards. And the animal that gets the positive reward will keep wanting to do that. The animal that gets the negative reward, it will probably stop doing that. Here's an example. B.F. Skinner, uh, the scientist who used rats, he actually had this uh, little lever inside their cage. When they would bump into the lever, a piece of food would come out. And at first, when they would bump into the lever, they would just, oh, eat the food and they wouldn't even realize what they had done. But after doing that enough times, they realize, oh, every time I hit this lever, this awesome thing happens. I get food. I'm gonna keep doing this. And that's when you finally paired together, like, hey, hit the lever, get the prize. And they keep doing it. And they'll keep like overfeeding themselves, doing it over and over and over. Uh, there's other versions of that experiment that aren't as pleasant to think about, where uh, the animal gets shocked if it hits something, and it's probably going to stop hitting that thing if it has that negative uh, reward, which is really not quite a reward at all. Uh, but that's operant conditioning. Another example in the wild would be jays, a kind of bird, and monarchs, a kind of butterfly. Monarch butterflies, they have a toxic substance inside of them. So jays that will initially um, you know, eat monarchs. It's you know, it's not instinct for them to avoid it. They'll they'll eat a monarch and they'll uh, it'll taste nasty. Some of them will get sick, and they realize like, oh, 
I'm not doing that again. So it's a negative reward. They don't want to do it again. So they're probably not going to go after that particular stimulus, that particular monarch look. And they might even avoid uh, viceroy butterflies because viceroy butterflies look very similar, but they're not toxic. They're actually uh, palatable. They're actually pretty tasty and would give nourishment. But that's an example of an animal in the wild noticing like, uh, I'm not doing that again. And their behavior has changed because of environmental factors. Imprinting. This is a kind of learned behavior that can only occur in a very specific time period. And usually it's early on in life that the examples that we talk about with imprinting. So it occurs during what's known as a sensitive period. The classic example is newly hatched birds. There are lots of bird species that when they hatch, whatever image they see after being hatched, they think, that's mother. I need to follow mother around. And that's a good thing. It, it ensures that the babies are attached to something, specifically the mother, that's going to care for them and nourish them until they're old enough to you know, live on their own. Uh, but it's interesting when scientists play around with that. There have been examples of uh, birds following around an old man, a human man, because they imprinted on him when they were born and thought he was the mother. And they've done this, uh, they've played around with the sensitive period in, in a lab setting numerous times, showing that this does exist um, in the animal kingdom. Salmon with chemicals. So uh, here's a little drawing of salmon. Amazingly, they have this uh, ability to smell with, with olfaction uh, this particular chemical signature where they know to go back to a certain stream to spawn every year. And that's something where they were exposed to that that unique smell early on in their life in that sensitive period and they just know where to go to get that smell and they know when they've basically made it home to spawn with um, you know other salmon and, and make babies now cognitive behavior so cognition is all about thinking using your brain and really figuring out the world and problem solving so this is thinking reasoning and processing information of course any cognitive behavior is going to give you an advantage in making it as an animal Birds, primates like us, and even octopi have been observed engaging in these types of behaviors. So the bigger brain you have, the more likely it is you're engaging in cognition. Two examples, ravens. Ravens, or some people call them crows, um, are very smart animals. You might not think at first glance that they are, but, but there's lots of examples. I've seen a video of um, a raven actually using a crosswalk. And with enough observation of its surroundings, it can realize that if I don't want to get hit by a car and I want to pick up a piece of food on the ground where the cars are, I'm going to wait for, you know, something to happen with the light and people walking. And I've seen them waiting for the little man to appear to signal a walk. And that's pretty amazing. That is a cognitive behavior. That's not something they were born knowing. Um, they figured out something with their environment to do it. Another example is there was a study done with like a little vending machine for, uh, for ravens or crows. And um, there was a reward system that took weeks for, for the birds to get, but they realized that if they took little coins on the ground, if they picked them up with their beak and put them in a slot, peanuts would come out and they'd eat the peanuts. And then eventually the other birds of the same you know, population nearby caught on and the one who figured out was like, hey, wait a minute. And I'm sure he wasn't very happy, but... Um, that's an example of cognition, figuring out something in your environment, realizing, ah, here's my advantage. And uh, that's definitely something that can be helpful with the organism in terms of survival. Chimps have uh, been observed doing so many different cognitive behaviors. I've seen uh, lots, of, lots of videos, one where they uh, will take a stick, uh, rip off branches, you know, it's from a tree, and they'll put it down an ant colony and they get ants on it and it's like a little snack for them. Without sticking, you know, the branch inside the, uh, the ant colony, it'd be really hard for them to get access to those insects, but that's cognition. Another one, um, uh, you could say that uh, in lab settings, there have been examples where there's a, um, it's a similar task with trying to get something deep down, but there'll be a long tube where they can't stick their hand down and there's food at the bottom and they're given uh, glasses of water. Some of them will realize if I take this water and pour it in the tube, I can make that other thing float and grab it. And it's definitely happened in a lab setting. Uh, that's, that's a cognitive behavior for sure. Competitive behaviors. So competition between individuals 
for control over resources. A few examples. Agonistic behavior. This is between two individuals of the same species, like bears or rams. So two bears, especially male bears who are fighting over food or potential mates, they might look like they're about to kill each other, but typically it won't lead to death. Um, it's possible one of them could get a little harmed or injured, but eventually what's usually going to happen is one of them is going to go away. It's going to be the defeated one and the other one is the winner. It get, gets access to the food or potential mates. That agonistic behavior has benefits to the one that succeeds. Dominance hierarchies. Top-ranked animal has access to resources above all others, like a pecking order with hens. So with uh, hens, um, with chickens, you'll have females where there's the one top female, and she'll literally peck at the lower females if they try to challenge her or get in the way, and, and she wants access to the roosters exclusively. So there's the top one, and that's an agonistic, or sorry, rather, dominance hierarchy. My, my apologies. It's a competitive behavior where she has dominance over the others. There's also examples where there's the alpha male. That's another dominance hierarchy um, in terms of one alpha male having exclusive rights to a harem, to a bunch of females, and eventually another male will challenge him and possibly win and become the new alpha male and have access to those females. Then there's also territorial behaviors. That's attempts to control an area from other animals of the same species. You can see this with primates and birds especially. There'll be a group of primates in the forest or jungle that have their own little area. And if others come close, they'll start shouting, they'll start fighting, um, and it could actually result in um, one group killing the others. It's, it's that serious in terms of maintaining a territory, this is their space, this is their food, um, and that behavior is meant to increase their survival rate. Um, not just chimps, with birds. Uh, birds have been uh, observed uh, actually pecking each other uh, and harming each other over uh, territory. And they're the same species. They're just two different populations occupying slightly different uh, territories. More types of behavior. Foraging behaviors. This is finding and eating food. Individuals who expend the least amount of energy in foraging are generally favored. Here's what it comes down to. The cost of you hunting for the food and trying to find the food and weighing that with the actual energy you get. If it takes too long for you to find food, uh, the method that that particular animal is using is probably not going to be successful. So it's this, you know, uh, cost versus uh, benefit kind of thing. Um, individuals who are going to be successful, they'll use the least amount of energy as they can to get the most amount of resources in terms of them finding food, whether it's berries or ants or um, leaves or whatever it might be. It could be fruits. Migratory behaviors. The move, that the migration actually, increases chance of survival in various species. So let's take um, birds. Wildebeests do it. Uh, here's the wildebeests found in Africa. But let's talk about birds. Uh, it's very common for birds in North America during the winter to fly south. Why is that? The North American winter can be kind of harsh for those birds. And in terms of the amount of food available here during the winter, not as abundant. So when they fly south as a group, they go to an area where it's not winter. They go to an area where it's actually uh, very nice in terms of the weather and the amount of food available. And then once that warmer period is ending down there, they'll fly back uh, to where it's more springtime, summertime in America, uh, or, or North America rather, and they'll have plenty of food and they'll breed during that period. Uh, how do they actually know where to go? There are innate signals that guide those populations. There are a lot of theories that um, Birds are sensitive to the magnetic pull that the Earth has, the magnetic field that we do not sense within our, our heads, but we have machinery that can definitely measure it. But birds, they may actually have a sense of um, magnetic fields, and that guides them to a specific spot. They may also pay attention to stars. It's hard to tell. Biological rhythms. These are cycles cued by environmental changes. So these rhythms are rooted in our DNA, but cues in the environment are signaling uh, kind of different patterns to occur with day versus night, usually. We're talking about circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms you could find in almost any organism. It's reactions to light versus dark, light versus dark over and over. Now, animals who are nocturnal, who are awake at night, they're going to have a different kind of circadian rhythm pattern than 
animals like us who are diurnal during the day. So if an animal is diurnal, awake during the day and, you know, eating during the day and asleep at night, when light is hitting us, when we actually can notice light, there is a wake period that occurs. When the sun goes down, we're more likely to start falling asleep or being sleepy. There have been studies where they take an animal out of the environment where they get, you know, uh, 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark, and they start making it 24 hours of dark or altering it in some other way. And eventually, after a few days, their sleep pattern just starts getting more erratic and not consistent because their body is used to seeing light versus day and cueing these circadian rhythms. And that's important in terms of the animal being successful, uh, finding food, getting rest when it's supposed to, and waking up and you know tackling the day again or the night again if it's nocturnal. Communication behaviors. All right, pheromones is one way that animals can communicate with each other. And if it has to do with success of the species and you know making offspring, that's going to be something that's retained and favored over time. So pheromones are airborne chemicals usually associated with relaying messages between the sexes, males and females, so that they can get together and reproduce. Uh, there are pheromones in humans that are probably impacting us. We're just not you know, aware of them consciously, but humans definitely secrete uh, pheromones. In animals, um, we've definitely studied them a lot. So with moths, here is a male moth. Look at this. Look at these antennae. They're quite branched. They look like little feathers coming out of its head. So this male moth once it actually has emerged from its cocoon and it's in its adult form, its mission is to find a female and make babies. And it waits for the pheromones. These pheromones, these chemicals secreted from the female could come from miles away. And all it takes is a few little molecules hitting these, these filaments. These filaments have a lot of surface area just waiting for those chemicals to be noticed. And they fly towards that, that chemical signature, th towards that pheromone. And that's how they're able to get the female and mate. And that's definitely an important thing for them in terms of communication behavior. Deer will, um, you know, leave secretions, like they'll rub a gland against a tree and, you know, a male will do it and signal uh, the, the females, hey, I'm here, and signal other males like, this is my area, I'm going to find a mate here. Auditory communication, it could be hoots, howls, barks, chirps, etc. There are lots of calls that animals will make. It could sometimes be about mating. Um, there are mating calls. Um, very common with, with birds to do that. Um, it's common with primates, of course, too. Um, lots of different animals do mating calls. Sometimes it's a warning about predators. Um, when it comes to meerkats, they'll make a, a call um, to warn uh, the rest of their, you know, their troop that, hey, there's, a, uh, there's something overhead that could eat us. And sometimes it's just about territory. Uh, like with howler monkeys, they'll make these crazy loud howls uh, that can go for a couple miles in terms of like being able to hear them. And they're telling the others in, in the jungle or in the forest, hey, this is our territory, stay away. And you know what? Language, that's how language started with us. Just calls and signals, um, vocalizations that have differences you know, warning signals versus, you know, um, vocalizations that are about like, hey, I care for you, we're friends, let's groom each other. You know, there are very simple things that would have happened millions of years ago in our ancestors that led to a more evolved language in terms of uh, the etymology and, and us having words that mean more complicated um, thoughts. All right, courting and nurturing behaviors. Uh, courting behaviors is about like, wooing. It's about getting a mate and making babies. So it's for attracting mates. A visual display is something you see a lot with birds. And this is actually one of the many species of birds of paradise. Found usually in tropical areas. This is the male in this particular um, painting. Uh, this male... Uh, <laughs> quite an elaborate uh, feather display. The female, not nearly as exciting looking, but that's okay. She doesn't need to look exciting. The males desire her more than anything, and she's the choosy one. It happens with peacocks as well. Um, by the way, peacocks and peahens, very different. Peacocks, male. Peahens, female. And together they're called peafowl or peabirds. Um, 
but yeah, the peacocks, like with Birds of Paradise, the pressure's on them with those feathers and that display to try to catch the eye of the female, and she's the choosy one in terms of choosing a mate. Uh, sometimes combat is the way that they, they, they court or woo a mate, like with rams that are bashing their, their, uh, their horns together, uh, and one of them's gonna be dominant, one of them's gonna win, and females will be like, I'm gonna mate with you, you're the winner. Um, song, uh, with birds, it's very common for them to, to have pressure to make a unique song, a complicated song that they invent. Uh, they have been exposed in their environment to certain songs that they heard uh, before they were able to mate. But once they are old enough to, to mate and be expected to, to win a female, male songbirds um, will, will come up with actually unique songs based on what they've heard. And the more complicated, the more uh, variation probably the more it's going to catch the ear of the female. And dancing, the blue-footed booby of the Galapagos. The blue-footed booby of the Galapagos, it, it, it has these bright blue feet and it does a dance and it displays its feet and uh, if the female likes it, they'll choose him. Nurturing behaviors. Parents are providing care to their offspring. If, if they're nurturing them, it does take a lot of energy, but it's worth the cost of that energy because it's ensuring that their offspring is going to be more successful. So it involves providing food to their babies, of course, protection from predators, and from even other animals of the same species, um, skills too for survival. Uh, when it comes to primates, they definitely have the best examples of long-term care. And actually, baby orangutans will spend years with their mother. Uh, they've been known to nurse their young for up to two years, and then they spend several more years tagging along with mom until they're ready to actually go out in their own in the forest and, and make their own family. And cooperative behaviors. So these are behaviors that actually uh, a population of organisms within a community will do to ensure survival or benefit to others rather than themselves. So it benefits all the members of the group in the long run, but sometimes it can end up in self-sacrifice. Here's an example, altruism. Altruistic behavior is a behavior that, that's a cooperative behavior that benefits another with a cost to itself. An example is naked mole rats or meerkats. So with naked mole rats, um, there's actually examples of non-mating individuals. So there are individuals in this population. You can see they're all huddled together in here. This is probably an exhibit at some kind of museum or animal park. That's why we have this nice view here. Um, but you'll have animals here within the naked roll map, or naked, sorry, naked mole rat uh, population that are not breeding with the, the queen mole rat, but they help care for the babies. They help ensure survival of the population, even though they are not directly tied. Uh, they're not directly the offspring of the individual. And it's all about ensuring success of the population in general. The theory there is kin selection. If the animal that you're caring for is your kin, meaning related to you in some way, sharing similar genetics, maybe they're a distant cousin in this animal population, but preserving some of your genes in the long run is beneficial because sort of the mission for animals, even though they may not cognitively realize this, they want to pass on their genes. Uh, it sounds selfish, but that's all about um, contributing biologically to the next generation. So even if they may suffer or may die in the process of doing something, uh, kin selection is all about ensuring that some of your genes still keep going on and, and at least organisms related to you somewhat closely will be successful. The same goes for meerkats. Uh, meerkats, uh, usually they're near the Kalahari Desert, uh, they will have uh, what's called a sentry. It's kind of like a lookout. That's what this meerkat is doing. It's, it's looking out um, looking up ahead, up above, because there are airborne predators, um, eagles and such, that will want to fly down and pick off a meerkat for lunch. So they have one that is on the lookout for the rest, and if they notice one, they're going to give the call and the signal. It's like go underground, uh, because they have this you know awesome burrowing community underneath. But sometimes in the process of this, you know, making that call and those signals, 
it can be vulnerable to the actual bird coming down and eating it. But, you know, in the process of potentially sacrificing itself, it's ensuring that a lot of its, you know, buddy meerkats and its uh, related meerkats survive. And that is definitely a cooperative behavior that falls under altruism. Thanks for watching Educator.com.